Today, we're going to continue in Hearing God, our series on Hearing God. And, and I want to tell you something. Uh, we, every year, you, you probably heard me say it or maybe heard Graham say it, every year we tend to do a two, three, four-part series on how to hear from God. Uh, last year, we did one called Audible. And uh, the summer before that, we did one called Identifying God's Voice. And, and so if you go to our website and you want any of those, if you go to sermons, you can pull it down by topic or by series, and you can get all of those. We, we, we talk a lot about hearing from God. And so this morning, I'm going to cover a subject with you that's mission critical, man, um, mission critical to this. And so, hey, here's what I want to do. I want us to pray, and I want us to ask God to, you know, G, you, know you ever notice how many times Jesus said things like, He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus said that. What what that tells us, we all got ears, right? But it means not everybody hears it. Sometimes we just don't hear it. Well, this morning, like, you really need to hear it about what the Word says uh, today. So let's pray. God, as we go into your Word, when we read it, it reads us. And I ask today that you give us eyes to see ears to hear, that we may know you deeper, wider, stronger. Today, what we're talking about is it is central to our ability to thrive, that the kingdom of God would come on earth as it is in heaven. Today, I pray we grasp that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so when it comes to hearing from God, I can tell you this. I don't know any Christian, and I would 100% put myself in this category. I've never met a Christian that doesn't struggle on some level to know, is that God or is that just me? You know, we all struggle with that. I mean, is that, did, did God put that thought in my head? Did God cause that encounter? You know, did, did, what happened there? Is what I'm feeling prompted to do from God, or is this just another crazy idea? You know, I mean, I've got crazy ideas, and sometimes they're not from God. You know how you know? Later. Um, you know, uh, that's how you know. But, but, but so for me, it's just, it's difficult. And so it, it, it really, it causes us to, to have pause. And, and, and I want to tell you, God wants you to have confidence. Did you hear me? God wants you to have confidence. He wants you to have confidence. I, I was listening to a guy, uh, a, a preacher that I really like, and, and, and it, it caught my ear because he talked about, uh, this was the place where I did my doctoral work. And I, I, I can't find the research because this place puts out so much research. Um, I tried a little bit, but they do a lot of research in, in the kingdom world. And, and, uh, but, but one thing this pastor brought up, and it, just, it, it made me think about this very topic, this, this very week actually. It was from Fuller Theological Seminary, which is where I went to school, my postgraduate work. And, and he said, 87, according to Fuller, 87% of Christians do not know their life purpose. And, uh, 87%. I actually think... Based on what I've seen empirically, I think that's conservative. I really do. I, I think the average Christian really, it does, we talk so much at Clearview about that God made you for a reason. God made you for a purpose. God didn't just put you on this earth to live and then die. God made you for a reason. So what is that reason? And, and, and if you're going to know what that reason is, then you're going to need to know how to hear from God. If you're going to know what God wants you to do with your life or even with your week, then you need to know how to hear from him. And so I really want to talk about that this morning. We've got to know how to hear from God. Jesus said something in, uh, in, in John about orphanage and not leaving us that way. And I want you to turn there with me this morning. Today I'm going to talk to you uh, as you turn to John chapter 14. We're going to go to John chapter 14. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to call this. I call this God's hearing aid. I think I, I may have got those out of order. Did we have the title up there? Yeah. And I'm not being cute, by the way. I, I don't believe in like cute titles. I actually mean that literally. God has a hearing aid for you. And it's called the Holy Spirit. 
there is a hearing aid that you have. So it's John chapter 14. And, you know, I, I study the Holy Spirit a lot. Uh, all of us have um, different things we kind of gravitate to. And, and if you think, wow, Jason talks about the Holy Spirit a lot. Yeah, yeah, I really do. A, a, a whole lot, actually. You know why? He's the only part of the Trinity on the earth. He's the only part of the Trinity on the earth. So you got to know the Holy Spirit, and Jesus talks a lot about the Holy Spirit, and 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 so the disciples are the disciples are kind of freaking out, and um, they they know Jesus is about to leave, and they don't know what's going to happen, and he says in John chapter fourteen verse sixteen, "I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever," and that is the Spirit of Truth. Whom the world cannot receive, pay attention to that, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. With and in, very important distinction. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let me tell you something, friend. That's a powerful statement. I will not leave you on your own. You ever felt alone? You ever felt like you were surrounded by people, but nobody saw what you're going through? You ever felt like you, you really you had something going on on the inside and nobody could understand it or put their arms around it, put their head around it? You ever felt abandoned? You, ever, you know, that's what was happening to the disciples. They were having this, this terror of abandonment. And Jesus said, listen, I mean, they didn't ask about being orphans. No, he knew what they were feeling. And he said, I'm not. It's going to get better, y'all. That's what he was saying. It's going to get better. It's actually going to get way better. So what does it mean for us to have God's hearing aid? What does that look like? How does that play out in the scriptures? Well, I want to start with, with this morning with why is the Holy Spirit important? Okay, why, why is actually the Holy Spirit important? Now, I'm going to show you some verses up here this morning. We're going to hang out in John, but there's, there's so much to be said that, that no one sermon could do it justice. In fact, uh, if you'll go to our website, if you want to know more about the Holy Spirit proper, we did a whole series on the Spirit of God. It was seven weeks long, and, and so you can go deeper in that if you want to. So we're going to just start for a second on why is the Holy Spirit important, and, and the short answer to why the Holy Spirit is important is because he's the life giver, okay? He's the life giver. In, in fact, Paul said in Romans 8, look at what it says in Romans 8, 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, okay? In you. So let me just stop right there before I forget to say it, okay? The Holy Spirit isn't an it. It's a he, all right? The Holy Spirit is not a holy it. It's a holy he. And every time I, I talk about the Holy Spirit, you've probably heard me say this, but I also know that you forget most of what I say by lunch. So it's okay. It keeps me in a job. Don't stop. Okay? It's all right. But, but what I know is this, right? We can talk about Jesus all day long, but, but in Christianity, there tends to be a lot of hesitancy when it comes to talking about the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you where that comes from. Hell. That comes from hell. Because the devil knew he could not beat Jesus at Pentecost. So what did he do? He made Jesus' people just a little bit leery of the Holy Spirit. How intelligent is that? Make them a little bit afraid of the life giver. Make them a little bit leery of the life giver. Make them a little bit skeptical of the power giver. And then you got them. Well, it says, it says that, that G, the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, Christ in me, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, Romans 8, 11, he will give what? Life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. So the same, same spirit that brought Christ up out of the dead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that spirit, Paul says, Christ in me is not a it. It's Jesus. 
It's Jesus Christ manifesting himself in me. And it's interesting about why the Spirit is so important because when you think about it, if you read on, in in just a minute we're going to look in John 16 because Jesus kind of comes back to the Holy Spirit in John 16. We're going to cover that in a second. But there's a portion of that in the Holy Spirit where we understand that he has, uh, the Holy Spirit has a ministry, too much to go into this morning. But when it comes to this world, I mean the actual planet, the Holy Spirit's presence for the planet is to convict of sin. There's a presence of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't offer, stay with me now or you're going to misunderstand, the Holy Spirit doesn't offer himself to the world He offers himself to the believer. You see, he gives himself to the world as the convicting agent, the judging agent. He gives himself, according to John 16, he gives himself as the presence drawing people to repentance. But the only place the Holy Spirit resides is in you as a believer. And that matters, friends. That should make you feel good. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, it should make you feel good. He resides in us. Let me tell you, that's how much God loves you. God loves you so much that when, now, now do you see when Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans? That's how much Jesus said, I, I love you so much, I'm going to move in. I'm going to move in. So the, the deeper you go in Jesus, that's why you don't feel comfortable with sin. You're not supposed to. The deeper you go in Jesus, you don't feel comfortable at home with anything this world can offer you. And I finally came to a place in my late 20s, early 30s, where I don't, I don't, I don't remember like a certain day, but I do remember a season of my life where I just stopped being afraid of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I just stopped. I stopped being skeptical. I said, God, anything you want to give me, I'll take it. Anything you want to show me, show it. Anything you want to do in me, do it. And you know, you know what happened? Nothing crazy. God didn't need my permission. See, we're so afraid that, you know, we're so afraid of the outlier experience This is from hell too, by the way. We're so afraid of the outlier experience that we just stay on the margins. And I don't want to be on the margins. I want to be in the middle of what God's doing in my life. And to do that, I can't approach it with fear or skepticism. So when the Holy Spirit came, he was the life giver. It wasn't, it wasn't until Pentecost when the New, Tur- the New Testament church was born that kind of started a domino effect, a, a catalyst. Notice something for those of you that read the Bible some. Notice what happened after Pentecost in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit, when Jesus ascended to heaven and then the whole, he, sent, he said, I'm going to send the helper, okay? You know, I've often wondered, like, there was a gap there for a few days. I mean, I don't know. That must have been something, don't you bet? Like to be sitting there in Jerusalem going, like he's really gone, y'all. It's a Hebrew word, y'all. He, so he's, a, he's, really, he's really gone. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, oh, I know that's him. He did what he, and when that happened, what happened? The church was born. We didn't become a nation of prophets until after that. We didn't become a nation of the royal priesthood of Jesus until after that. We didn't become heirs until after that. That's when Christ moved in. And when he moved in, he empowered all of us. We became a church. So he's not a holy it. He's a holy he. So you know why I talk about the Holy Spirit so much? I'll tell you why. Because if you want to know, if you want to know the ways of God, then you better know the ways of the Spirit. Because that's the hearing aid that he gave you to understand his voice. So you're, listen to me, Christian. If you've never taken time, I'm, t- I'm talking to everybody. If you've never taken time to read the Word of God 
and go deep in the scriptures about the Holy Spirit, you are hurting you. You're hurting you. So I want you to imagine for a second that, that, that God called you to build a house, let's say. God called you to actually build a house. Footer, rebar, frame it, wire it up, rough it in, drywall it. I'm giving flashbacks of terror to some of you. They're, oh my gosh, those were the worst days. The bad illustration, Jason, don't talk about that. They always say if you can make it through a, building a home, you can survive anything, right? Um, if you, imagine that. If God called you to go build a house and he gave you a toolbox, but you said, nah, whatever. You know, I'll figure it out. We have words for people like you. I'm not going to say them. No, God, if God gives you a toolbox and he gives you tools, why would you not pick them up? So if you want to know the ways of God, know the ways of the Spirit and who he is. So that moves us to this idea then, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in hearing from God? If he's the hearing aid, how does that work? How does it work? Well, there's, there's, there's many, many areas of that, and I'm going to cover something with you this morning that, that I really never covered with you because I told you I study this stuff myself all the time, and in this, this whole year, I, I would say most of this year, uh, at least probably since March, April, maybe even before that, there was a, a concept in Proverbs that, that, that I'd really never run upon, and just, just I've read the verse before, but it never just like sunk into me. I'm going to cover something with you that I think might help you a little bit. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in hearing from God? Well, according to what John told us, uh, he, he brings truth to the forefront, right? He brings truth to the forefront. John just said that he, in the first thing that Jesus calls him after calling him the helper, by the way, if you want to know the attributes, if you want to know the personality of the Holy Spirit, go through John 14 and John chapter 16 slowly and start looking for the names he gives him. Helper. Spirit of truth, okay? So, spirit of truth. He brings truth to the forefront. So, how does that happen, right? I think we have a verse out of Proverbs 20. Is it up there? Do we have a, yeah, Proverbs 20, 27. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. Now, that's in the Old Testament, but I've camped out on that verse for months and months and months, breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down, not for this sermon, for me, for me. And Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit, spirit, breath, wind, that's the original word, spirit, breath, wind, the, 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 the soul. What that means is, see, the, 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 the Hebrew idea and the Greek idea of the New Testament, the Hebrew and the Old Testament, Greek and the New, the, those ideas of what the spirit is are pretty actually closely aligned. And it, and it, means, it means your inner soul, your mind, your heart, your will, your emotions, all of those things. All of those things that make you you, your mind, your heart, your will, your emotions. The spirit of mankind, that's, that's not man by gender, the spirit of mankind is the lamp of the Lord. The spirit inside of you is the lamp of the Lord. Well, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, what happened? Jesus crucified the old man. We show it up there all the time. He crucified the old person. And out of the waters comes the new, right? It, it doesn't happen by magic. That happens when you repent. But that is a symbolic gesture of what happens. Christ in me becomes the hope of glory. So inside of me, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. And, so, and the person that really helped me understand this more than any other person is someone that I deeply admire. I would love to have met him before he went to heaven, but his name was Dallas Willard. And if you want a great book on how to hear from God, go, go catch up with Hearing God. It's a great book. I've read it a few times. It's, it's, you can't read it fast. He, he doesn't work like that. You just don't get to go fast through Dallas Willard. I mean, in fact, my brain tends to hurt after Dallas Willard. But the way Willard ex explains this verse is, I want, you to, I want you to all do something for me. Let's, let's pretend for a minute, okay? Let's pretend. Don't say we don't have fun on Sunday morning. Let's pretend for a second. We all have living rooms, right? We've all got living rooms. 
You've all got to play. Where, where do you watch college football? For those of you that know Jesus and watch college football. For those of you that are saved and watch college football. So where, where, where's your place you do that, right? All right, or what, what, what place do you watch your show? Over in the chapel, where do you watch your stuff? You know, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother uh, she didn't put up with a whole lot of, like, frilly stuff. But boy, don't call her between 11 and 1 every day. She had her program. I found out later, you know. It was pretty funny. Uh, you know, she didn't like gossip, but boy, she loved Days of Our Lives. I want to tell you, you know. But, um, so, so you have this place that you watch stuff. So imagine for a second that that room is dark. But you know it, right? You know the room. I mean, you could go in there even in the dark and probably get around. So I want you to imagine for a second that you have a, a big flashlight. And as you scan that room, oh, there's the couch. I want you to put yourself in your living room right now. There's the couch. The power just went out. There's the couch. There's, oh, yep, there's the TV. There's the fireplace. There's the coffee table that we got when we first got married. There's the picture of the kids, my favorite photo. There's the dog, right? There's no cat because cats don't go to heaven, all right? (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. Just saying. It's in Deuteronomy, I promise. That's not true. All right? It's not true. All right? But if, if you went into a dark room, if you went into a dark room that you know when the lamp goes through it, all of a sudden, oh yeah, who, who lives in me? Christ. In me is the hope of glory, right? So Christ in me, the Spirit, as he pans across my life, heart, mind, soul, emotions, and when there's something that ought not be there, the Spirit of the man is the what? Lamp of the Lord, searching the innermost being. You see, what the Holy Spirit does is that he resides in you. And so as Graham talked about last week, that whole voice, the the, the voice of condemnation comes from hell, but the voice of conviction comes from God. So when there's something inside of you that isn't truthful on any aspect of what it means to be righteous in Christ, then the spirit of, the, of a person is the lamp of the Lord. And so that inner testimony, that inner place where you know, mm, man, so knowing how to discern the voice of God, the voice of the Father, Jesus said, my sheep, that's us, hear my voice and they follow me and they will not follow a stranger. So how do we know that? Well, the Bible says that the spirit of you, the spirit of Christ in you is the lamp of God, and it's the filtering out. It, it gives you the ability to bring truth to the forefront. It searches the soul. Really, for alignment is the easiest way to say it. He searches my soul for alignment. That's what he's doing. He searches my soul for alignment. Now, when it comes to this aspect of truth, so when, that, when, that, when the Holy Spirit is panning your life 24-7, he's searching your soul to be aligned with God. And when you're not, it's going to raise up. It's going to come out. So what does it mean? I told you we're going to go to John 16. So flip over one page because we're going to be there. Jesus comes back to the Holy Spirit about bringing truth to the forefront. And in John 16, verse 13, Jesus comes back to the Holy Spirit who is promised. And he's made several declarations about the personality of the Holy Spirit, starting with the fact that he's going to convict the world. But then he moves to the believer and he says, But when he, verse 13, chapter 16, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. This is a really important verse. We'll start over again. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He's a discloser. 
He brings truth to the forefront. And let me tell you why that matters. I think this is where a lot of the Christian church gets scared. And at, or let me say it a different way. This is where over the annals of history, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 years, in the last 100 years, this is where if we get sidetracked, it's typically in matters like this. This is where if it goes off the rails, this is where it tends to happen. Because the Bible is what we call a closed canon. Meaning from Genesis to Revelation, that is the sign, sealed, delivered word of God. Okay? There's no new truth about Jesus. It's revealed right here. There's no new truth about Jesus. But what people have done, false prophets over time, uh, deceivers over time, they will come up with new things about God or attributes that the, and blame it on the Holy Spirit and, and say that, you know, God is revealing to me something new. And, and no, what the Holy Spirit does, if you look in John 16, 13, what did he say? He will not speak on his own initiative. He's a conduit for what was already in the heart of God, but he only speaks what he hears and he will disclose to you what is to come. So what he does when he brings truth to the forefront and when he searches my soul for alignment, what he's doing is he's taking me deeper inside the person of Christ. God showing me how to love better. That's what the Holy Spirit does. God showing me through the Holy Spirit how to forgive more. God showing me how to approach a situation like Christ would. It is an alignment. It is an alignment where, where I'm, I'm discovering the deeper parts of Christ. In fact, if you, if you uh, read about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance those things that I said to you. So there have been many times, you, you've had this happen to you a bunch, you may not realize what was going on. You, you're, maybe you're in an anxious moment, Something's bothering you, and then you hear in that deep part of your soul where the lamp of the Lord brings things to the forefront. The peace I give you is not what the world gives you. That's the voice of God. He brought to remembrance something. When you're going through an ethical situation, sitting in a sales meeting, and you're reading a contract, and you're going, hmm, I wonder if we should disclose that or not. I don't know. I don't know. And then you hear all of a sudden, do unto others. Hmm. You see, that is the inner testimony, the lamp of the Lord. So what happens is the Holy Spirit is there to bring into remembrance those things. It's critical if you want to hear from God, that you know the ways of the Spirit. So let's ask a different question this morning. Let's ask a different question. Why is it that God wants me to hear? Why would God want me to hear his voice? Why would he want to do that? Why would God want me to hear his voice? We talked about who the Holy Spirit is, but it, what is the real reason here? What, what is the real reason of exactly what is it that makes this such a big deal. Well, I really believe that it does come back to this idea of confidence. If you're not confident, you're going to have a lot of trouble. In fact, I would say life in Christ, it's not impossible, but it sure is hard if you don't have confidence in how to discern the voice of God in your heart, your mind, your soul, your emotions, it gets really, really difficult. So it comes down to this issue of knowing that you've heard from God on something, that you've heard from God. Why would God want me to hear his voice? Well, I, I believe there's a couple of key truths in that. One, God wants me to be confident that I am his. He wants me to be confident that I am his. You see, when the disciples were starting to panic, Jesus was going to leave, he got ahead of them and spoke to the fact, no, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. You are mine. You're mine. Don't panic. You're mine. Don't panic. 
In fact, it says, Paul, Paul backs this up in Romans 8. He, he says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. Huge verse. Man, you've got to learn this verse. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified with him. The Holy Spirit has a constant two-way conversation with me between me and the Father that I am a child of God. And that, friend, brings confidence. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. If you've come to Christ and you've repented of your sins, you don't have to worry if you're walking on shaky ground eternally. Because if you stay in that place, I mean, listen, let's face it. There are days that I feel closer to God than others. There are times in my life I feel closer to God than others. But my eternal security, my salvation, isn't built and founded on an emotion. Aren't you glad? It's built on a promise. It's built on a promise. Your eternal security, meaning once you are, once you are in Christ, you, you're not going to get out of Christ. Listen, can you imagine getting up every day going, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That's why we see some people being baptized three, four, five, six, seven times, right? Some of you were brought up in cultures like that. Let me tell you something, friend. You don't have to worry if you are in Christ. If you repented of your sins and you came to Christ, you're going to know it. You're going to know it because you're different. You're changed. You're not who you ought to be, but praise God, you're not who you used to be. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, I'm telling you, you see the change that Jesus made. And so the Holy Spirit inside of you testifies with your spirit, a two-way conversation going on and on, that you are him. You see, here's what happened. Here's what happened. This is like, this is really good stuff, and you're not acting like it, but I'm telling you, it really is. I mean, look, so, so here's the deal. When Pentecost came, right, when Pentecost happened, when the, when the, if you're not familiar with that term, it's when the Holy Spirit was birthed into humanity in the book of Acts. When, the, when, the, when Pentecost came, the gap between the creator and the created shut. You with me? The gap between the father and the heir closed. See, some of you had a dad. Well, we all had it. A biological dad. Some of you had a father figure, stepdad, maybe a grandfather that acted more like maybe your father because you didn't know your dad. Some, by statistic, most men had a bad dad. By statistic, from what I've read in my life. By statistic, most men with their father are at best okay. We're okay. Some of you Women, you've been, you've seen the worst side of manhood. Some of you had unspeakable things done to you by your dad. But you need to know that you have a heavenly father who is perfect. And he never breaks promises. He never breaks promises. He is kind, compassionate, accepting. He doesn't care how many commas are in your net worth. He doesn't care what kind of education you have or you don't. He doesn't care how many achievements you've had. That creator God, he loved you so much. See, I I've known people in my time that grew up in orphanages or were adopted, didn't know their mom, dad, didn't know their biological family, didn't have a real reference point of that. And while I can't imagine how tough that must be psychologically at times, I want you to know something. The most important family name you're ever going to have is the name of Christ, and that name you own. You've got that name. 
The most important father in your life has told you from the beginning, you are mine and I am yours, and nobody's changing that. Nobody's changing that. So you see, the gap between the creator and the human being closed forever when the Holy Spirit was sent. And he sealed it. In fact, Paul even talks about him being the seal of deposit. It's a huge verse. You got to go read it. One more thing I want to share with you about this idea of why this matters so much. It's not just because God wants you to be confident that you're in him and he's in you. It's that God wants to guide me toward life. I told you that he's the life giver and he is the life giver. But if you don't, if you don't know the ways of the Holy Spirit and you can't discern the voice of God and you don't know how to hear God, it's going to be really hard for God to guide you toward life. Because when you're not confident, listen, I don't care the most arrogant person in the world or the, or the person that struggles with their self-esteem, the, the polar opposites, doesn't matter. All of us face confidence issues at times. It just looks different for everybody. Okay? So if, if you're not confident, one of two things is going to happen to you. Okay? Usually it's this one. You're going to freeze. You're going to lock up. Right? You're going to lock up. Every, every person that I know that really struggles with self-confidence tends to lock up. They're frozen. Well, God made you for a reason, and God built you for a purpose, and he built you for a calling. But if you don't know how to discern the voice of God, you know what you're going to do? Nothing. You're going to stand still, and you're going to wait, and you're going to wait, and you're going to overanalyze, and you're going to overanalyze, and you're going to overanalyze, and you're going to overthink it, you're going to overthink it, you're going to overthink it, and you're going to continue to think about all the ways. Because I think what happens so often in the body of Christ, and I can't prove this biblically, but it is in 1 Jason somewhere, I'm telling you that I really do think for sure that, that most of the time the reasons Christians don't engage their calling is we're, we are so much more obsessed about being wrong in Jesus' name that we won't take any risk in Jesus' name at all. We're so afraid to be wrong. So when Christians pray, oh God, show me your will, show me your will, oftentimes what you're doing is you're really saying, God, show me the perfect plan so that if I get it wrong, I can blame it on you. Just like Adam did when, when he said, the woman you gave me made me eat that apple. Right? Women, we've been blaming y'all for far too long. Nobody made him eat that. But we're so afraid to be wrong, that we sit and we wait and life passes us by. And I'm telling you, if you can learn to hear the voice of God, you can move forward in the confidence because he's the life giver, he's the power giver, he's the initiator, and he's not the giver of fear, amen? He's not the giver of fear. You're either going to freeze or, or... I told you, you're going to do one of two things if you're not confident in hearing the voice of God. You're, you're either going to lock up and freeze, or you're going to do what so many people do. You're going to spend a lifetime chasing the non-eternal. You're going to pursue material things, and all they're going to bring you is more stuff for your kids to clean out when you die. You're going to end up chasing job titles because if I could just get initials in front of my name, they would think I'm something. You're going to spend a lifetime chasing money when the whole time God has told you you're going to die with none of it. So what we end up doing is if we don't know how to, how, to, how to discern the voice of God, we end up chasing the anti-Christ stuff. Because the, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in my 48 years of walking this planet, the enemy is really good at making me think, oh, if I could just have fill in the blank, it would all be. I could, 
if I could just blank. So we end up chasing the non-eternal. God wants you to hear from him, friend. He really does. He wants you to hear from him, but know this in your heart. He wants you to hear with the purpose of obeying. And the purpose of obeying is that you can find life. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, John 10, 10, I have come that you can have life. And when you know how to hear from God, and when you know how to be moved of God, and I, I didn't plan on saying this, but I'm going to say it for a second. I want to stop for a minute because I want to tell you how this works, okay? Might have happened to you, has never happened to me. The Bible says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But I've never found from Genesis to Revelation a single verse of Scripture that tells me that God promises me a road map with the perfect exits and entry points. He just doesn't do that. If you look in the Old Testament, God did give guidance. And to Abraham, the guidance came in the form of walk. See, some of you could never follow God because you ain't, that's, that's going to be the voice of the devil right there. Can I get, I mean, you know, you're going you're gonna to go to some of your friends and they're going to say, well, let me tell you something. God would never give you something as loosey-goosey as that. Well, he sure did with Abraham. See, God, let me tell you something. I got pretty mad at God one time. By the way, if you ever get mad at God, tell him. He can take it, I promise. I'm not, I'm not kidding. And I'm like, look, I need to be able to hear from you better and what I realized that through, in fact, it got so bad one time that, um, and I was well on. I mean, I was well on in my years of ministry. I, I, I've had this happen more than a couple times. I remember one time sitting in my, my, my chair, and I basically said this to God. I said, look, I'm sitting right here, and when you're ready to talk to me, I'm ready to listen, but I'm pretty mad, so I'm not, even, I'm not saying another word. And I did that for months. And I would go to that chair and I would say, all right, where you at? See, told you. And I'd move on with my day. I was hot. You know, and because and, I wanted to hear from him. But what, I, what he finally, you know, look, let me save you some time. I'm a full service pastor, okay? You're not going to win battles like that. All right? You're just not. So when I got over myself... The power of God's Holy Spirit showed me I don't have to talk the way you want me to. There's all kinds of ways he speaks. I don't have to play that game. You don't get to make up the rules, Hoss. And I've, I am in a constant, this is turning into group therapy, but I'm going to go with it. I'm in, I, I'm in a constant battle with God on not projecting onto him ways that make sense to me when it comes to communication. It's really hard. But, what we want so often is this road map because we don't want to be wrong. But if you look through the annals of Scripture, what you're going to find is that God does guide a step at a time. What did he tell Noah? Build a boat. Can you imagine? Like it took years. Noah was the village idiot. Everybody that walked their kid to school, who's that, daddy? That, honey, don't get me started. That's the crazy guy. He was the village idiot right up until the day it rained. 
See, they had never, it, they had never seen rain. Go read it. It didn't, hadn't rained before. God irrigated the ground from the ground up. They had never seen rain. Build a boat. What's that? It floats. Why? Moses, go talk to a man named Pharaoh. Why? What's he going to do? I'll tell you later. So often, we're obsessed with it going wrong that we never step into the light so that it can be right. And if you want to hear from God, he will show you. But my experience is, much like crossing the River Jordan, the waters didn't part till the priests got their feet in the water. It, it wasn't until they got their boots wet that's when the water parted. You want God to speak to you? Act on the thing you're seeing in front of you. Pray for wisdom. God, the purpose of hearing is obeying. And the purpose of obeying is that you can follow through with the next right step. And as you continue to do that, friends, God will continue to part the ways and show you parts of himself. But you've got the best hearing aid in the world. It's called the spirit of the living Christ in you. Amen. And you can trust that. The spirit of us is the lamp of the Lord, searching the innermost parts. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter, but sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.